Hi, welcome to From Thinking to Inking, the podcast dedicated to creating the greatest collection of the most in-depth author interviews ever assembled. I'm your host, TJ Mercer, and this begins our interview series with Peter Mintz about his book, All Your Fortresses. All Your Fortresses is a post-apocalyptic action-adventure story with a dose of philosophy set in the U.S. state of Georgia. It follows a group of refugees and revolutionaries after a complete economic implosion, and it explores the potential fallout from such an occurrence. Uh, Today we're going to talk about Peter's love of books, history, philosophy, economics, and how all of that came together to influence the story. We also briefly mention his absolutely gorgeous daughter. It's a fascinating discussion, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you for joining me, Peter, and agreeing to do this interview. Uh, really appreciate it, taking the time. Um, so uh, let's start off by uh, just letting everybody get to know you a little bit. So uh, tell me about yourself outside of the world of writing. Well, hmm. I teach a lot of stuff at a small school that I own, Heritage Classical Study Center. I teach history literature and Latin. Don't anybody get the idea that I'm some Latin scholar. It's beginner's Latin. Uh, It's pretty basic, but it's important. Um, I also teach government and economics. We're on a four-year rotation, so I don't teach those every year, but I I read about them constantly, uh, always trying to learn more and and upgrade my knowledge about them. So, since you want to interview me about this book, a lot of that enters into the book. So, um, one thing people always ask me about my, you know, family, and I, I always forget to say anything. Not because I'm ashamed of them; I love my family, but just I, I don't understand why people are that interested in it when they listen to something like this. But I've been married for as of this summer; it'll be 40 years. Uh, really happily married. Um, have uh, four children, uh, all grown. One of them is married to you. I don't know if we should say that, but <laughs> there it is. Um, and, keep, the, uh, keep the nepotism on the down low. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, and uh, my dog is out here on the deck with me, so we may have some interruptions. I hope not. <laughs> eh, people like dogs. It's fine. <laughs> Um, so, uh, going through the, the brief questionnaire that, um, I sent you. So, uh, what's the first story that you can remember loving? It it could be anything like, uh, I think the first one I remember loving was, uh, David and Goliath. I was kind of obsessed with that when I was three or four years old. So fictional, real, doesn't matter. Honestly, it's a toss up between Digger Dan and Rackety Boom. Rackety Boom was an old blue truck, the kind of a truck that might get stuck in the mud on a hill or just stand still for a while any place with a smile on his face, a nice old truck, and it goes on. Um, So, I mean, I've been interested in stories for as long as I can remember. As I got a little older, um, there were uh, stories like Rifles for Wadey, around fourth, fifth grade, I read that. I don't know, two or three times. There was a book called Ranger of 76. All this tied in with my interest in history because the Rifles for Wadey was a, a, an award-winning book about the Civil War. And then Ranger of 76 was about this kid who becomes a, a, a ranger in the Continental Army in 1776 from New York. And, um, and then it went on from there. I've never stopped reading, so... What are, what are some of the books that you would say uh, changed your life in a couple ways? So it could be uh, emotional, but also maybe even changed how you looked at what a book or a story could be. Because for a while, there's kind of entertainment for a lot of people. And then you find that one thing, you're like, oh, I didn't know you could do that with a story. That's amazing. Well, I, I guess a couple things. I I held off reading The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. I saw friends reading it, and I just thought, eh, who wants to read that stuff? And but then I read it and uh, uh, was just captivated by it. And now I've read it about all four of the books about 20 times. Um, the The thing that, that captured me there, though, wasn't the so much the genre, but the quality of Tolkien's writing, his 
development of characters. Um, one of the things I've always done is I've admired well-written sentences. So, for example, in uh, uh, I, uh, The Two Towers, where um, Pippin and Merry are captured by the orcs in Rohan and, and are, are dragged across Rohan, there's this great sentence um, about their, and, and I won't, I haven't read it for a while now, so I won't get it exactly right, but it was something like the, the, uh, their legs beat out a nightmare. Uh, whoa, I'm not even going to get it right. Uh, nightmare cadence of time or something of wire and horn. I don't know. I, I wish I didn't realize you were going to ask that question. So <laughs> I didn't look it up, but it's a great sentence. But then to one I can quote perfectly is from uh, Moby Dick. Uh, describing Ahab, one of the owners of the Pequod says, he's a grand, ungodly, godlike man. Uh, I mean, that's a sentence that in nine words, he's, he's captured so much. And you can read it in less than a second, but to, to, to actually unpack that sentence takes a long time. There's so much in it. And so it's a sort of a sentence I, I, I lift out of a book and I, I just hold it up to admire it. So, you, you know, partly, I think always, I want to see good writing. I mean, I, after reading Lord of the Rings, I tried to read some other fantasy stuff because I thought, yeah, maybe this isn't so bad. And to be honest with you, most of it was poor copies at best. I, it, they didn't develop the characters the way Tolkien did. Um, you know, even now, even though I've read it many times and I know exactly what's going to happen, I find myself almost cheering for them. I, when the riders of Rohan appear at the, the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, it just makes you want to jump up and down. And not many riders can pull that off. It's often referred to as a, uh, a stand up and cheer moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I heard, I read a, I read an essay a while ago that um, uh, the writer argued that the fantasy genre might have actually been better off without Tolkien, which he prefaces he loves Tolkien. Tolkien's amazing, but the thing was Tolkien was so far ahead of everybody that he shot the fantasy genre too far forward, too far fast, and all the other writers had to. It took decades to catch up to where he had jumped forward. Rather than a slow build, it would be like if um, we were inside of the chariot days um, of like Rome and stuff, and then somebody invented a car. And so then we would have lost all of the slow progression of transportation as everybody tried to duplicate this car that somebody had made. Because And you just kind of end up in a dark ages of transportation for years until somebody else, finally, until other people finally figure out how to make it work correctly. On the other hand, it gives him a goal to shoot for. And, and I'd much rather be trying to reach a high bar and fail than easily jump over a low bar. That is true. Um, so do you look, so I guess from that, do, do you look more for um, the, as far as what you look for inside of a good book, do you look for, oh, this story sounds interesting, uh, or is it more of a, uh, um, just you fall in love with how the author writes? Well, it's a little of both. I mean, you know, I read uh, Neville Shute, for example, um, is uh, he's most famous for On the Beach, it's probably his second most famous book is A Town Like Alice. Um, I, I initially read him for the content for... Um, um, you know, with, with On the Beach, this, this aftermath of a nuclear war. Um, and, you know, what, what, um, what was his vision for what that would be like? And, and I felt like he brought special interest to it because he was an aeronautical engineer. He wasn't just a novelist. In fact, his, his primary work was being an aeronautical engineer. He did secret work for the uh, Royal Navy during World War II. 
And um, he always brings a little bit of his engineering into his books. Um, but he had a special level of expertise to, uh, to, to consider what the aftermath of a nuclear war would be like with his engineer, given his engineering background. So I, I initially read him for that, but I, I liked it so much, I started reading his other books. And I, I can't say that I have any single sentence from Neville Shute like I do from Melville or Tolkien, but uh, there are other things about his techniques and his style that really interest me. Um, one of which I, I sort of employed in my book where he starts at a certain point and then uh, uh, transitions. I think that <laughs> Shute probably did it better than I did, but he, uh, he'll transition in such a way that it's not jarring. You don't even sort of realize it's happening until you stop and look back and say, wait, how did we get here? Um, and so he's got this book called In the Wet, where this uh, uh, Bush brother priest in Australia goes out to see this guy who's, who's really sick, probably dying. And you have this whole story going on. And then somehow in the midst of this, he, he shifts to a story 30 years in the future. There's reincarnation involved, but it, it's not heavy handed at all. And what he's doing is exploring what's going to happen to the British Empire 30 years on. And so it, it's a really interesting technique, and you kind of forget that he's done it until near the end of the book he comes back to this hut in the, in the outback, and you realize, oh my goodness, <laughs> how did we get... I didn't even realize we left. And, and That's right, we, we left this spot. Yeah, exactly. So... It, it, it's clever and well done, and it, it it doesn't it doesn't seem contrived at all when he does it. It it seemed to me a good way to get into a story, not every story, but many stories. You you uh, you teach literature. Are there uh, what are some of the books that you most enjoy teaching? Because um, obviously you've got like the classics you have to get through, but what are some that just every time? it's time to read that when you get a little bit excited about exposing your students to that book. Well, could I tell you the ones I least like first? Sure. That's always fun. <laughs> With my seventh and eighth graders, we read The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper. It is horrible writing. I mean, it's terrible. It's as though Cooper doesn't remember what he wrote, and then he suddenly realizes, wait, I need to get myself out of this. So rather than go back and fix what he's written already, he just writes some totally implausible explanation for how to, in order to write himself out of this mess. And it's just terrible. But he was the first American author writing about American themes who was widely accepted on both sides of the Atlantic. So I think students ought to read some Cooper, but it's hysterically funny without meaning to be. I mean, Mark Twain even wrote a, uh, an essay about it, uh, the literary offenses of James Fenimore Cooper. Um, and I mean, that leads to the single funniest day in six years of our seventh, and eight, seventh through 12th grade rotation at Heritage. Um, and then, so the you other, do get excited about that one, but for well, a different yes, reason. But, but, but not in the way, a way that would be flattering to James Fenimore Cooper. Um, <laughs> and then the other book that I absolutely hate, but we read it because it's, it's a part of the culture and students need to see, read it for cultural literacy, is Gulliver's Travels. I despise that book. Uh, I, I think it's vulgar. It's disgusting in many ways, um, but it's quoted everywhere. I mean, I, when my daughters were still in high school, they were watching Gilmore Girls, and I walked through the room, and it was talking about Brobdingnagians, and you hear about Lilliputians, and Yahoos, and, and all of that comes from Gulliver's Travels. So in, in order to appreciate those references, you need to have read Gulliver's Travels, but I dread it every time I teach it. Now, 
what do I like to teach? Gosh, almost everything because I've, I'm the one who chose all the books. So they're all, they're all books I think are important. Um, but the ones that I really get excited about, uh, I guess are, and I will, I will certainly leave some out, but, um, I, I really love it when we get to, um, 20th century American novelists. Um, I, I really, um, enjoy, we, we do a farewell to arms by Hemingway, uh, which, I mean, the first paragraph of that, even though it's prose, it, it reads like poetry. And if, if it's properly read, he's talking about troops marching down the road, uh, and the, the very rhythm of it, the way he punctuates it, his, his use of the language, you can almost hear the rhythm of the marching feet as he describes it, which is, I don't know that I've seen that in any other writer. Um, now, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with Ernest Hemingway. I mean, his writing is incredible. His worldview was bankrupt. Um, and he's sucked a lot of people into his worldview by the quality of his writing. Uh, the Great Gatsby, which we just finished reading again, um, I always look forward to that. The only, the only thing I would like better about doing The Great Gatsby if, is if we could do it in the summer, because it, it's a summer book to me. And, and, uh, but it's so well written. And since I just mentioned Hemingway, Hemingway thought it was fantastic. He, he thought it was exceptionally well written. And I think he was right. He and Fitzgerald were friends, weren't they? Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of funny, though. I'm Hemingway, you know, you hear how much, I hear, always hear about how much Hemingway drank, but he was pretty disgusted with how much Fitzgerald drank. So, um, <laughs> you know, they had wow. this one, You've they had this the one line at that point. <laughs> oh, yeah. They had this one drunken drive across France that, oh, it's a good thing they didn't have as many cars on the road in those days as they do now. They never would have made it. But um, anyway, so I like those, but you know, we do uh, in the ancient years, uh, I love to read the Confessions of St. Augustine, um, particularly because at one point he says, um, we sinned by doing less than was expected of us in uh, uh, writing and reading and literature or, or something like that. In fact, one of my students actually gave me a plaque with that on it for a graduation one year. Um, and I, I just have a lot of fun with that with the students. Um, I enjoy, we, we, we do a little bit of Faulkner, um, As I Lay Dying. I chose that because Faulkner can be very hard uh, even for college students, let alone high school students. And As I Lay Dying at least has some humor in it. It has what yeah. used to be, I think, the shortest, the shortest chapter in literature. I've since read one that's even shorter, but um, it's a chapter called Vardaman and says, My Mother is a Fish. And um, I ask students, what does Vardaman mean? And I've even seen teachers who can't figure out what it means, literature teachers who can't figure out what it means. But anyway, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let people read it for themselves. <laughs> Just in case your students here. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, we, we read, uh, we, you know, you mentioned the classics. I, I always enjoy when we do, uh, and this may sound unusual given my interest, but Pride and Prejudice. Now, I do like to joke around that, you know, they could have spiced it up by having a chase scene or something, you know, a couple of carriages chasing each other. You should, you um, should give Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies a chance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, we, I guess there are other books I really love. I, I like almost all the books we read. Um I told you the two I dread, so everything else is covered. I don't know if you have our reading list or not, but it's it's a pretty challenging reading list for high school and seventh and eighth grade students. Um, I, there are a couple. Of, there are a couple of books I really like. They're short books. We read them in seventh and eighth. They're the seventh and eighth grade students, um, Daisy Miller and Ethan Frome. 
Um, and one of the things I like about those two books is they're so great for teaching about writing um, and about writing techniques. Um, Daisy Miller, for example, apparently is, is just gorgeous, dresses to perfection. But Henry James only calls her beautiful one time. He always refers to her as pretty. And that's not by accident. Um, in Ethan Frome, even the name of the village that Edith Wharton puts in Starkville creates, you know, the very name of the village creates an impression for you. Um, and, the, and the way she uses the weather in that story to um, um, inform you about Ethan Frome's internal condition, his, his psychological condition, if you will. And of course, we always read Shakespeare. And, and since I just mentioned a psychological disposition, one, of the th we, one book, one play we read is Much Ado About Nothing, which, I mean, how can you not like that play? Um, but one of the things I love about that play is that Shakespeare didn't feel the, the need that so many modern authors do of giving some psychological reason why Don John is a villain. He just is. And that's really kind of refreshing. You, you know, we don't always need a big psychological background. Some people are just evil. That seems to be forgotten in today's world. I had a conversation with um, James Legg um, a couple of years ago about how uh, because we've done that, just looking at past movies and uh, even books, there really has not been a great villain in probably about a decade. Uh, you think about some of the more well-known ones, uh, even uh, Heath Ledger's uh, version of the Joker was a wonderful performance, but it was a character that was created way back in the thirties. And I think there is a good, it's good to have a, uh, an understandable villain, uh, somebody you can understand their motivations and what they're doing makes sense. But I think we may have swung too far to where now we can't, it's difficult to have somebody that is just evil. Well, I think a lot of that comes from the culture. I, well, I don't know which came first, but I think a lot of people have derived that from the culture. The, many people are unwilling to admit that there are people who are just evil. And sometimes it's unexplainable. What, why is this person this way? Um, and not only that, but there are times when you run into somebody, you have no way of knowing their background. You have no way of knowing their, you know, what led them to be what they are, whether they're just born evil or whether they had a horrible, had lots of horrible experiences in their life, but you don't know them. You run into them. Hey, one time I was, I was, I, I had an incident where this guy exhibited some road rage and, and I, I got trapped behind him and he came back and uh, it, it was May, my windows were open and he grabbed my face and started screaming at me. I have no way of knowing why he was that way other than I think he was drunk, but I'm not sure. Um, and you know, that happens. You don't know, and you don't always need to know. The need, what I needed to know is how do I get out of there without getting killed, which I did. I hopped a curb and drove away, <laughs> so. Um, but, you know, I know, I never saw the guy again, don't know anything about him. And I, I, I don't know why people feel the need to always give us this background in books. It's not always necessary. Yeah, um, I, I like backgrounds of, if in a fantasy, setting get let me know how the villain became so powerful like that's that that's all that i want to know uh after that just oh sure let's let's try to stop him <laughs> sure well i'm not i'm not suggesting there's never a reason for it i just don't i don't like the compulsion to do it with every villain you don't do it with every good person you don't explain why they're good you know why is it the why do we make the assumption that well, I think it comes from Rousseau, who was personally, he was a creep, but he basically told us everybody was basically good, or at least neutral. Um, so with, and, with that worldview, people need to know why you went bad. If you're good, then we yeah. just assume it's because nothing horrible happened to you, and you just stayed on that Well, path. it's because we're, 
It's because we're prideful and we, we think, we just sort of assume we're good. Well, no, we're not. And throughout history, most people have recognized that. It's, it's only pretty recent, recently, I mean, by recently, I mean the last couple hundred years, that, that people have started thinking, well, you know, we're basically good and some people just go wrong. No, we all go wrong all the time. And, and if we're honest with ourselves, we know that. Uh, and this is why, you know, a good character in a book has to have some flaws. And um, y you can't make them perfect. Um, it's, it, it's one of the reasons why I think Superman is so boring. Uh, and, and other authors or, or writers of, about Superman have thought so too, which is why Kryptonite seems to be just laying about everywhere for him to be weakened, because otherwise he's boring. If you don't weaken him, he's boring. Yeah, so. I realized that when I was like 11 in my sisters, when they're, you know, at that time they would have been nine and eight, we're, we're just all like, you know, there's a lot of Kryptonites just lying. It seems yeah. very easy to find. <laughs> Which makes you wonder how he has any superpowers. It seems <laughs> know, to grow on trees. Seems like the earth is kind of made out of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which would make him the weakest one of all. Anyway. Well, uh, talking about Superman, which is very much so a, a pop culture thing. So a lot of people think about um, literature teachers and people that love history as kind of stuffy and you like the classics and that kind of thing. So what are some of your, uh, your guilty pleasure books or movies that you, you really can't on a, just a purely quality level justify that you love it. You just do. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Um, you want movies or books? Either um, one. Well, you know, occasionally I like to read something that just has a good plot. I actually did read a book recently, and, and I, I got, well, I shouldn't say I read it. I listened to it on Audible, uh, and it was on sale, so I thought, okay, let me read this. It's something I've never read, uh, and I, I really enjoyed it. It was, um, oh, let me tell you the right name. Let the Rain Come Down, let the... Um, at any rate, I, I listen to this book, and it's a fairly current book, and uh, it had a, uh, the plot was really interesting. It had some great plot twists. I, I don't think it's, oh, it, or, I'm sorry, it was called Send Down the Rain by Charles Martin, and apparently all his books have the ti have the word rain in the title. <laughs> I don't know why, but looking at them, he's all about rain. Yeah, the plot twists in this book were really interesting. Um, but, and the protagonist, well, let me back up a minute ago. A minute. Uh, years ago, I read uh, uh, some John Grisham. When he was first coming on the scene, and uh, I read the Pelican Brief. In fact, in fact, that's the one I think I'm thinking about now. Uh, and the plot twists were great, and and the plot was captivating. But when I finished the book, I couldn't even really remember the the protagonist's name. Uh, the characters were not. I, I mentioned earlier about Tolkien building characters that are, you know, they're believable. You care about what happens to them. I didn't really care what happened to this uh, main character in uh, Pelican Brief. It was just an interesting plot. Uh, Send Down the Rain, I actually cared more about the main character. Um, there's some, um, he goes through some real setbacks that he's not in a position to do anything to correct. And so it, it, it's a fun read. Um, and I'll probably read other books by Martin. Um, sort of a guilty pleasure. I don't think it's going to become one of the great classics, but I would say it's been one of the, the better maybe beach reads out there these days. Mm. I um, guess more than, more so than guilty pleasure beach read. That, that's, that's, that's more what I'm looking for. You're, you're, you're off. You don't have to be work. You don't have to be working on reading a classic book right now. What, what are you enjoying? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> it's probably not what you might think, because I, I 
read Thomas Sowell on economics and on racial disparities, and I, I read Victor, da Victor Davis Hanson is fantastic. He's got a new book or books out. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's one or several volumes. Um, I, he calls it the Second World Wars because he makes the, the observation that really, we call it the Second World War, but it was really almost like several different wars being fought o all over the world. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading that. His other stuff has really fascinated me. So, you know, it's the Send Down the Rain was really the most uh, pop culture type of thing I've read in quite a while because most of the time when there's a big buzz about something, I'm not impressed. Uh, it takes a while. I'm not an early adopter because um, I don't know, maybe I'm snooty. I don't really mean to be, but, uh, so often they fall short. And I did, I, you know, I enjoyed Harry Potter. Uh, I sort of resisted the Harry Potter craze, but everybody, including my own kids were reading it. So I thought, okay, I'll give it a chance. And well, it's, it's pretty good. I, I have, some problems with it, but it's, it's not problems with the writing. The writing is, is really good. And, um, uh, but you know, there aren't too many books. Any of us couldn't find some things we don't like about it, but. Uh, right, right. And there's so many books out there. So I understand being choosy about which. Oh, and so read. little time. That's what I love about Audible because there's so little time. So I can at least read some things or listen to some things when I couldn't otherwise be reading. And, and that just thrills me because I've just always felt like there's not enough time to read everything I want to read. Yeah, I have a, uh, I use goodreads.com to, I have a giant massive um, to read list on there. Um, mm -hmm. And it, so anytime, but a lot of it is anytime that somebody recommends some recommends to me just so I remember it. I add it on there and I actually have it kind of ordered and like when I'm going to read each book just to keep track and try to help me uh, maintain. And it, the, it's so big. It, it, I think it's over 800 books right now, but it's so big that anytime I read the first book in a series and just didn't like it, it's almost a relief because I think, Oh, well that's five books. I can take, I can just go ahead and take off of, this cue that I yeah. don't have to read now. <laughs> I get that. Um, yeah, if somebody doesn't capture me in the first book, I mean, I, I'm not, we talked about fantasy earlier. I'm not, as a rule, a fan of, of science fiction. I never could get into Dune. I know lots of people love Dune, and I just, it just left me cold. But now, Isaac Asimov's Foundation series was fascinating. Um, and I, I just couldn't put that down. Uh, but he brings in some really interesting uh, um, uh, ideas uh, about, you know, what, what makes, uh, um, how does an empire grow? How does it decline? Uh, it doesn't involve too much with economics, but a, a good deal with uh, the development of technology and and why it develops the way it does. And so uh, that series, I just I couldn't get enough of. But right, yeah. Uh, so it's so interesting because uh, um, we this actually got brought up with the uh, the last interview I did where. It's so cool because so much of it, like not as far as the text, not much happens. You hear about this fight that happened. You hear about the empire fell. Most of it is just people in a room talking and you, you can't stop turning the page because just what they're saying is so interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like movies. I mean, um, when you go back to say the thirties and forties, maybe even the fifties, you've got a lot of movies that there's just so much dialogue and very little action, certainly by today's standards. I mean, where in Casablanca is there an explosion? Where, where does a car blow up? Nowhere. Um, 
Uh, Maltese Falcon, same thing. I, okay, there is a, a steamer that catches on fire, but it's incidental, it's not central. Um, to, to write a screenplay for a movie like that takes so much more skill than just, okay, let's, how can we get on to the next explosion or the next leap over a great chasm or something, you know, it's just so unbelievable and it's cheap or it costs a lot of money, but from a writing standpoint, it's cheap. And I mean, that goes all the way back to Aristotle and poetics. He talks about how, uh, he, he says the spectacle, but where he says spectacle, we would say special effects. He says it's, it's just, it's the cheapest thing you can do. Um, and, you know, I, I like a, a movie or a book that's going to assi assume that the watchers, the readers have a brain, not one that assumes they don't. Um, it, it, it's just so much more satisfying. Yeah. Um, I like it when they do that with uh, kids' stories, too. Um, like One's not leaping to mind, but where it's... Well, I guess a lot of Pixar movies where they just have a whole lot of depth inside of the um, inside of the characters and their motivations and stuff, and they don't assume well, sure. that kids Listen. are dumb and that they'll understand it. Like, Toy Story, Woody's entire motivation is jealousy, which is something that doesn't come mm -hmm. up outside of, like, a little a mor a morality book. Um, but they, they assume kids are going to understand this. They're going to understand I'm losing my best friend and I don't want to lose my best friend. And I, I like it when I, I agree. I, I like it. I like not being treated stupid. <laughs> well, I, I never talk down to my kids. I mean, yes, I tried to talk to them in a way they could understand, but I never talked down to them. I mean, I took into account their vocabulary, their experience, but I didn't. I always, I assume everybody's smart. They have to prove to me that they're not. And it's a little hard for them to do that because I'm going to try to get, draw out every ounce of intelligence from them I can. And um, I have had a handful of people prove to me that they're not smart, but not many. Most people, most people really are smart in their own way. They may not have the same type of knowledge that, that other people have, but that doesn't mean they're not smart. Yeah, I can't remember where I heard it. Uh, I used to hear um, the phrase, uh, there's a difference between stupid and ignorant. A stupid person cannot learn. An ignorant person just hasn't. Well, yeah, and and ignorant just depends on where you're standing. I mean, if I, I don't really know New York City. I've been there a few times, but only on business, so I never saw any of the, the touristy sites, and, and I could have, it could have been any, just about any city in the country, because I was just in offices. I take that back. One time I had to go up there just to be designated driver for a Christmas party, <laughs> but, but I really didn't see anything of New York. I don't know New York, so if I go to New York, I'm the one who's ignorant about the locality. But if a New Yorker comes here to Georgia, then they're the ones that appear ignorant. Does that mean they're unintelligent? No. Does it mean I'm unintelligent because I'm in New York? No. It just means I don't know my way around. And and that can be addressed. Um, so um, I much prefer, uh, makes life more interesting when you assume people are intelligent and when you can learn something from them. And I can, I've learned stuff from people who have nowhere, I don't have a vast education. I don't have a lot of graduate degrees like some people do, but I've known people who haven't even graduated high school from whom I can learn a lot. And, and you know, you're a parent now, you know, you've even learned from your own children before they learn how to read, you can learn from them. So uh, sometimes just because they see the world from a different perspective and they ask a question that never occurred to you to ask. At any rate, that's happened to me a lot. And, and uh, so I always, I always want to treat everybody uh, with dignity, whether I'm writing about them or whether I'm, uh, um, whether it's in real life, it makes for a much happier life. And I think a more interesting book. What, uh, what stories would you say, uh, 
were a influence on on uh, all your fortune on all your fortresses. Um, which one? Either uh, as far as theming goes, or plot, or even just setting. Ooh, I'd say, you know, probably the the only only story or stories that were an influence on it. And and this is not. I'm not saying this because I. I haven't learned from other writers, but the only one that, that consciously may have been is um, virtually any of Neville Shute's books or, or most of Neville Shute's books. And that has to do with that transition he has that I talked about earlier, because I was trying to figure out how do I get into this story? How do I, uh, and, and to me, that's the hardest thing. I, f I feel like all your fortresses if you can endure the first couple of chapters, it does start to get better. Um, I, I feel like the early part is the weakest part of the book. Um, partly because I'm just trying to get to someplace else and, you know, part, you know, it, it is a juggling act not to bore people to death as you set up the, the story. Um, and I felt like Shoot's approach um, was to, to getting into a story was probably the best choice for what I was doing. Um, that said, um, my inspiration for, for this story really came more from economics and, and politics and history than from any kind of um, work of fiction. Um, I wasn't, basically I'm extremely concerned, uh, about the national debt. We've let it get completely out of control and someday we're going to have to pay that. It's going to come due. We're already harmed by it. And I, but how do you get people interested in, in that kind of topic? Most people are bored to death with economics, uh, or they think they don't understand it because professional economists, most of them, want it to be seem like sort of a black art for for uh, purposes of their job security. But really, most of economics is pretty common sense, and it's not that hard to understand. But if I wrote a straight nonfiction book about the concerns about the national debt, nobody would read it. So I wanted to write a book that involved that, but had the, uh, it was my intent, I don't know that I succeeded, but it was my intent to write a ripping good yarn that happened to uh, um, interest people about the concern, because it's going to affect all of us. It already does. I mean, here we are, as you're doing this interview, we're going through this COVID-19 quarantine. And about a week ago, the, the Congress passed this $2 trillion so-called stimulus bill. Horrible name for that bill, by the way. You know, if we had kept our debt under control, um, this might be a good way to go. But at, at nearly $23 trillion in debt, and now we add $2 trillion more, that doesn't make sense. I don't know if you know this, but as recently as 1992, our national debt was only $3.6 trillion. That's after over 200 years of American history. And yet in the last 28 years, we've increased it by $20 trillion, more than $20 trillion. What's going on here? Um, people right now are feeling the the a lot of people are feeling the economic impact of this quarantine. The people who have been prudent and who have saved their money have some cushion. The people who haven't are in real trouble right now. And nations are no different. Um, obviously, there are times you need to go into debt. There's certain things that you can't afford otherwise, but you really need, like maybe a house. Uh, most people just can't pay cash for a house. But you need to be prudent about it. And our nation has not been prudent about it. So most of this was influenced by that. And then 
the idea is, well, well, if we have an economic collapse, what's it going to look like? And it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, my older son, your brother-in-law, Ian, uh, said you know, he lives over in Athens, Georgia, and, and Athens had one of the earliest pretty much shelter-in-place orders around. And he said, you know, this is starting to look a lot like your book. Um, and I, I, so that influenced how, now I will say there was one other influence and this wasn't so much, and this was more a historical influence. Um, I've always been fascinated with what led the American colonists in, 17, in the 1770s to be willing to take up arms against their own government. Now don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Unabomber. I'm, I am fascinated with history. And, and why do people do what they do? I mean, you look at the French Revolution and yeah, you can really understand why those people rose up. I think they got it all wrong, but you can understand why they rose up. The, the vast majority of the French people were just they were just trodden down by the upper classes. They had to pay all the taxes and the rich people, the aristocrats didn't have to pay any taxes or hardly any taxes. Where's the justice in that? They were the ones that had the money. Yeah, and, and that, the, the, you know, that uh, narrative is portrayed in our system today, but in fact, the rich, the, the top 1% or top 5% anyway, pay like 40% of all taxes. So it's not at all like France in the old regime. Um, uh, somebody pointed out years ago that um, the, the issue with the, uh, the Robin Hood story is that um, people here rob the, rob the rich to feed the poor. Um, but it's actually, if you just think about how that society worked, it was actually rob the government to feed the poor because it was the royalty and the nobility and the people that lived off of the taxes of everybody else. So it was not an aristocracy. It was not the um, financially elite. It was literally just the, it was the government at the time, which is very different from, you know, Jeff Bezos who made something a lot of people use and would give him money for it. Well, I, you know, I, I hate Robin Hood. The reason I hate it is because most people don't think about it that way. They just think rob the rich and give to the poor. And I, I, I just, I think that's criminal. Um, and so it's, it's hard to admire that. I understand what you're saying, and, and, but, but I think it's a bad story for today. You have, a few years ago, we had the Occupy Wall Street movement and let's take from the rich. Look, if they took everything every billionaire, multi-billionaire in this country had, they still couldn't put a dent in our um, national debt, let alone pay for all the, the programs that the politicians want to pay for. And, you know, uh, some people who will listen to your podcast or may listen to your podcast are not going to be happy with that. But if they will look into economics a little bit, not what they were taught in public schools, but actual economics and the way economics work, they'll find that's true. I mean, you look at LBJ's great society. Listen, LBJ, I really think he had great intentions. And I think he genuinely wanted to help the poor, but we have more people mired in poverty now than we did then. Um, but most people don't stop and look at that. Most people just look at the surface. Um, and so, so my hope was to kind of try to teach people a little bit about that in a way that was enjoyable. Uh, I don't dwell on it in the book because there are other things that need to be dealt with. But anyway, the historical thing, you know, why did the American colonists, unlike the French, they weren't downtrodden. This was predominantly middle-class country. There were very few people who were really poor, very few who were really rich. Almost everybody in the country was middle class. Why, why would they resist their government? Why, why would they lay down their lives about that? I mean, at the time, 
Of course, the, the British Navy was the most powerful in the world. The British Army was the best trained in the world. And for these farmers and shopkeepers to stand up to them, why would, what, what would motivate them to do that? And the thing is, it was principle. It wasn't because they were had been enslaved. It wasn't because they had been robbed. It was on principle. And not many people make a stand on principle these days. Most people want to, it seems like they want to take whatever shortcut they can. And, and I think it hurts us all when we do that. This probably isn't what you want to talk about, but sorry, you asked. Next slide. Uh, it, that, that's something I, I, rest, I started wrestling with a couple of years ago um, as far as the American Revolution goes because um, so many of them were, uh, of the founders were deeply religious. Um, actually, I heard somebody say that uh, not too long ago um, that a lot of people say that they were, that no, they were actually Unitarians. But if you look at a lot of their writing, it was really just Franklin and Jefferson that were the Unitarians. And then that person also added, and those were the two that spent the most time in France. So interpret from that what you will. But um, Well, I would say Jefferson, I would say Jefferson was clearly a deist. Uh, we're always told that Benjamin Franklin was a deist. And I think he was when he was 17, 18 years old. But when he was like 81 at the uh, um, Constitutional Convention, it was, it was Franklin, of all people, who called for prayer. He said, um, you know, I've lived a long time and I've learned that if a sparrow doesn't fall without his notice, a great empire can't rise without his aid. Well, that, that doesn't sound like a deist. Uh, uh, the dea, the god of deism is one who who makes the clock winds it up and walks away and has nothing to do with it why would you pray um and and just i'm sorry just as an aside this is what drives me crazy about many historians is that they don't recognize that people can and do change their outlook over time and and i don't know why that should surprise anybody how many of us look back on our teenage years, high school years, and wish we were like that again. I'm sure a few people do, but I sure don't. I'm glad I've grown out of that nonsense. And, um, but yes, yeah, so the, you know, they all, they all were men of faith and, uh, the Bible says submit to authority. So it was just, what, and it was the same thing. What was that line that was crossed that they said, no, we do not, we should not submit to this authority anymore. Um, Cause it, yeah. for a lot of them, it, it was against a tenet of their faith. Um, we were, they were inside of the whole era of, um, Oh, what was it called? Uh, divine, not divine appointment, but the idea that God made that person King and therefore they could do whatever, whatever they wanted was God's will. And that was a hard mindset to break from. And, you know, it's kind of, it's a, it's a, bastardization of what the actual what the scripture says it means but that's what a lot of people believed and so yeah what was that line yeah well that, they that, they talked the about cost they talked about absolute monarchs and they talked about the divine right of kings um that's it but they also at the same time and and this is the thing that kind of set america apart is that you had some highly intelligent people reading uh, things like uh, John Locke's second treatise on government. And uh, so you had all this, this enlightenment thinking about um, the social contract. And even though many of these people were uh, strongly committed believers, um, some of them weren't, but they were brought up in a, at a time when there was a Christian consensus, and so they were highly influenced by Christian thinking. Um, despite this idea of obeying the authorities, there was also a sense in which the authorities had a responsibility to behave well, and you see, see that in the Bible as well. I mean, look at Saul. I mean, he starts out doing well, and then, then he blows it, and God's not real happy with him and gets rid of him. Um, you, you look at the prophets, what are they so often doing? They're, they're telling the king, hey, uh, 
you 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 are not being a good king here. Uh, look at Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego when when they're told to they refuse to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's idol, and he says, "I I I can slay you." And they, their response is respectful, but firm. It's you know. O king, live forever, which I always thought was a funny thing to say to a king. You know they're not going to live forever. O king, live forever. Um, may you live forever. Um, but we, we believe our God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow to your idol. And why? Because they were first commanded to um, honor the Lord their God. And... and have no other God before him. So they're not about to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's idol. And, but at the same time, they saw that essentially Nebuchadnezzar, all authority is delegated, but Nebuchadnezzar was abrogating his authority by telling them to bow down to a different God and they weren't gonna do it. So they weren't so much rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar is they were obeying God. And I think that's how a lot of the, the founders of this country, and by that, I'm, I'm not just talking about the, the ones we know by name. I'm talking about so many others who participated in this movement, this war, uh, and the development of the early republic felt about it. It's, and what they believed about it is that we need to obey God first. Um, now, as far as the social contract, though, again, they felt like the, they, they believed, I, I don't even like the word felt, they believed that parliament and the king were abrogating their authority. They were going beyond the British constitution, which I've always thought was a funny word, t term because the British don't even have a constitution like we do. It's sort of a hodgepodge collection we have an actual written constitution we can point to. Um, but, but that is why they were able to do this on principle. And that I do sort of address that in, in all your fortresses because uh, towards, the, well, you know, there, there's a question asked of somebody. He says, you know, he, he has to obey orders. Well, because it's, it's part of his oath. And then, He's questioned about that, and oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so it has to do with abrogating authority. Thank you for listening to this interview with Peter Mintz. Next episode, we'll discuss the planning that went into the story and take a, a broad overview of his writing process. If you'd like to support his writing, it's as simple as buying his book. All Your Fortresses is available for purchase on Amazon right now. If you liked what he had to say and you're interested in learning more or you'd like your teenager to learn more, you can look up his school at heritageclassical.com, H-E-R-I-T-A-G-E-C-L-A-S-S-I-C-A-L.com. It's not on the site yet, but due to the COVID-19 situation, they will be offering remote classes next semester for both the quarantined and the out-of-state. If you'd like to support this podcast, please subscribe. We're available at... Uh... You know, uh, podcasters always mention what podcast services they're available on, but you really couldn't be listening now if, if, if you didn't know where it's available. Why, why do they... Why do they bother with that? It'd be a lot like a TV show saying, if you like this show, please watch next week. This show is on ABC. I know it's on ABC. I'm watching ABC. And that's how I saw it. Huh. Oh my gosh, uh, the Adam West Batman show did that. Same bat time, same bat channel. Podcasters are imitating the 60s version of Batman. Why is that? Where was I? Uh, you, you can also share this podcast with friends uh, you think might enjoy it, uh, and we are available probably any way that they listen to podcasts. Um, if you're a writer and you'd like to appear on this podcast, you can email me at thinktoinkpodcast at gmail.com. You can also support us by becoming a patron on patreon.com slash thinking to inking. Uh, I'm TJ Mercer, and this is how stories happen. From Thingy to Inking is a bookworm podcast from Corticate Entertainment. Theme music is an original composition by and property of Hannah Osmond Scheidt. She may be contacted at hannahosmondscheidt.com, H-A-N-N-A-H-A-U-S-B-A-N-D-S-C-H-E-I-D-T.com.